Hosanna and good morning. Welcome to University Baptist Church on this sixth and final Sunday of Lent, Palm Sunday, March 28th, 2021. For anyone watching who doesn't know me, my name is David Tomasacci, and I'm the director of music here at University Baptist Church. At any time, you can pause and check out this video's description to see listed there today's worship order, leaders, and musicians. I'll also take this moment to invite each of you to sing along during the Approaching God hymn, the doxology, and our postlude for the season of Lent, Shalom Habarim. I'd like to thank Pastor Carol Kautz for delivering the sermon and benediction this morning and for shaping this service over the past month. It's been a pleasure working with her. I'd also like to take a moment and thank those who contributed to UBC's online Lenten devotional series this past week. My thanks to Pat Rohrbaugh for her reading of Psalm 121 and her written devotional on the challenge of tending the gardens of our own hearts, souls, and minds. To my mother, Karen Tomasachi, for her video devotional on the Pussy Willow and how it has come to serve as a symbol of renewal and the resurrection. To Erin Goebel for her devotional on reconciliation and the challenges of being ambassadors of Christ and to Helen and Ken Watkins for their devotional yesterday. If you haven't done so yet, please remember to take a moment and check our Facebook page for today's special Palm Sunday devotional. Our message and music for today is the song Spread Branches by Carolyn Johnson. Our archival recording of this piece comes from Palm Sunday of 2019. Partway through Spread Branches, you'll hear the melody and second verse words of the iconic Lenten and Holy Week hymn, Herzliebster Jesu, Ah, Holy Jesus. The music of Herzliebster Jesu was written in 1640 by Johann Kruger, setting the words written by Johann Hiermann in 1630. Our anthem, Spread Branches, quotes the following second verse. Who was the guilty? Who brought this upon thee? Alas, my treason, Jesus, hath undone thee. Twas I, Lord Jesus, I it was denied thee, I crucified thee. And now I invite you all to join us in this Palm Sunday service and in worship this morning. Hosanna, Shalom, peace be with you and welcome to University Baptist Church. Welcome to University Baptist Church. I'm Ken Watkins, I'm the associate pastor and um, at UBC Columbus, Ohio. Um, if you are new to us, if this is your, someone has recommended you to, to you to watch this video, to watch our worship video, then I want to give you a special welcome. Um, each week when I do my greeting, I, I think about things maybe God is speaking to me and about, and, uh, and, and the things that uh, God is speaking to me about often are stimulated by the fact that I'm going to do the video, this video of greeting. Um, over the years, I, I, I would visit with a, a, a spiritual director once a month, and uh, one of the things she'd always ask me was, uh, in, what are the ways that God's speaking to me? Uh, or uh, in, in what has God said to me through the, through the events of my life? Now, Jesus was a master at, at utilizing the things around him as, as object lessons. Uh, today, uh, my object lesson today is that... Uh, uh, the, I'm stimulated by the by the uh, uh, recycle recycle bin that's to my to my left, and uh, it, you're right. If you're if you're looking over my shoulder and out the window of my car, you're you're seeing a a, a, a dumpster. And um, uh, every week or so, we we bring our our recyclables out for to to uh, to the dumpster. I was thinking about, I was thinking about church. I was thinking about how that uh, church is a thing, is a place where uh, there's a, the, the recycling is constantly going on. Uh, the things I put in this bin that eventually will turn up in some other form. Uh, they'll be reshaped, they'll be melted down. They'll, I don't know what the process is for each of those items that I put in there, but they will be become useful again. Uh, church is a place where we can bring our lives and that those parts of our lives that may not look 
to us to be worth very much uh, can be recycled by God. Uh, God is the great alchemist, the great one who can take the baser things of life and make beautiful things out of them. I invite you as we worship today on this um, uh, on the, on this um, Palm Sunday, I invite you to 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 open your life, open your hearts, open your ears uh, to the Word of God, to God speaking to you, and allow God to touch your hearts, and let and and allow God to make anew the things within you, and in the process make you into something new, and. Um, make you into something that is usable in a new way. So uh, thank you for joining us today. May God bless us as we, sh as we share in this worship time. Amen. Good morning. Please join us for the call to worship. We give thanks to you, O God, for you are good. Your steadfast love endures forever. Open to us the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give God thanks. Let us worship God. We give you thanks, O God, for opening to us the gates of your righteousness. Morning by morning, we shall arise to praise you. Day by day, we shall be led by your word. Hear our rejoicing and receive our thanksgiving. Blessed be Christ, our Redeemer. Come, Lord Jesus. Come. Amen. And now, join us in praying the prayer that your son taught us. Our, our Father. Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Hello, my name is Joyous Mayo, and at this time I would ask that you please join me in a reading of the scriptures for this Palm Sunday. Our first reading comes from Luke chapter 9, verses 51 through 56, chapter 19, verses 28 through 30, and verse 41. A Samaritan village refuses to receive Jesus. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, but they did not receive him, because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. Our next readings can be found in Luke chapter 19, verses 28 through 40 and verse 41. Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. After he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethphage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been written. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Just say this, The Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They said, The Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. Jesus weeps over Jerusalem. As he came near and saw the city, he wept over it. May God add blessings to the reading of his word. Amen. Good morning to all. This uh, Palm Sunday for 2021. It is such a pleasure and is always, always a privilege to be in this pulpit for you this morning. This is indeed the second Latin season for all of this virus pandemic that we have been fighting. We have lost so much because of it. Most tragically, of course, the loss of life here in the United States and around the world, the loss of jobs, businesses, schooling, any sense of really when all this will have end and what might become a new normal, a new way of life, the way of life, with our what our faith calls us to consider every day, whither goest thou? Where are you going? In Lent, we pay a special attention to this question, a deeper intentional study of what our life is supposed to be. And as we go to Jerusalem with Jesus today, we will consider how he did this most intentionally, steadfastly, and determinedly. We go with Jesus on this Palm Sunday and his final week as on a pilgrimage. We will take the road to Jerusalem as St. Luke writes about it in his gospel. Oh, I know we're in Mark for the, this year's lectionary readings, but 
oh, Luke's account is so much more drawn out and expressive and suspenseful that I just had to use it. As soon as Reverend Ken said I was assigned to speak this day, I went to the Lenten devotional for First Congregational Church up here to see what the word of the day is. We used words from Martin Marty's book that he uh, wrote on the lifestyles of the Quakers. And the word for Palm Sunday is direction. Direction. Immediately, my mind went in 40 different directions because the word has so many ways it can be used. So the word for Palm Sunday is direction. Direction, first of all, is a course along which someone or something moves. We go from point A to point B by plane, train, or automobile. We hope to do it as smoothly and quickly as we can. The streets in the section of Mansfield where I live are all hard to learn as they turn and curve and even change names when you cross the street. I used to live four streets down on Bigelow Road, but when you got to the bottom of the hill and crossed Davis Road, it became Shepherd Road. And people just couldn't figure that out for the longest time, especially my husband, who was very bad at directions. And it took him several weeks to learn how to get from his office about four blocks away to our house. And finally, he learned it. It was a running joke with our family, of course. Direction. Whither goest thou? So, here we go with Jesus as we begin his pilgrimage to Jerusalem. He is in Capernaum when he first decides that he must go for a final time to Jerusalem. Ten times, ten times between chapter 9, verse 51, and chapter 19, verse 41, Luke reminds us, even as Jesus reminds himself of what he must do, go to Jerusalem. Capernaum is at the very northern end shore of the Sea of Galilee and almost at, at the border of what we now know as Lebanon. Google Maps gives two ways to go to Jerusalem from there. We could walk, we would be walking surely. So one route would be 102 miles and take 35 hours to walk. And the other route is 118 miles and take 40 hours to walk. Several days of walking in either direction, in either route of the direction you took. Ten times Luke notes that Jesus is going to Jerusalem. However, it is difficult to trace his route as he seems to have backtracked in several places. His direction is not straight from point A to point B, Capernaum south to Jerusalem. But each time Luke very particularly tells us that he is proceeding on his way to Jerusalem. There is no indication either of how long it was before he finally got to Jerusalem. But as one reads what happened between chapter 9, verse 51, and chapter 19, verse 41, it would seem that he was not in any hurry, just that it was the direction he was headed for eventually. The first announcement is in Luke 9, verse 51. And it is one of the most heartbreaking statements ever uttered. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. He set his face. Whither goest thou? You just shudder under the weight of what this means for him. 
Here we have Jesus in all his humanity making the most important decision of his life, of our life. I am going to see this through. I will do what my father asks me to do. I will obey. Direction. The second major definition is the management or guidance of someone or something, training or learning. All along those 10 chapters, Luke tells a story, tells story after story of Jesus healing and teaching and giving direction to the disciples. He even sends them out on their own for a student teaching class in how to be a disciple in practice. It has always seemed to me that in the Synoptic Gospels, Jesus is learning how to be the Messiah. His becoming Jesus the Christ is a process for him, every bit of it as much as it is for us, day by day. And he set his face to Jerusalem. Sarah Oregon Ramos wrote a devotion about direction for the Palm Sunday. She considers both ways to define direction, one as a road trip, possibly needing a GPS or a map from AAA, neither one, of course, which Jesus would have had. But she also writes of direction as teaching or instruction. Sarah and her husband, Martin, are the dance instructors for the Richland Academy of the Arts here in Mansfield. They teach and guide their students to learn the different kinds of dance, ballet, tap, modern. But there are times and places where a person has no choice about what they will do with their life. Arden's life is a life in which he had no choice no direction for him to take. Sarah's husband is Cuban. Martin was born in 1966 in Santiago de Cuba, quite near the Guantanamo Bay and on the eastern end of the island. When Fidel Castro ousted the Batista regime in January 1959, communist rule was established with dominant control from Russia. And from then on, the idea of someone, anyone, but the government giving direction to your life on the island was taken away. The question of whither goest thou was never asked by the individual anymore. One was told where to go, what to do, when, how. But the why was always because we told you so. And so when Martin was seven years old, the government agents came to his local school and told each student what direction their life would take. He was told that he would be going to the ballet school. Hmm? And though Martin's father said, oh, no way, there really was no choice. From age 7 to 16, Martin was in ballet school in Santiago to Cuba. All the teachers were from Russia, who also had had no choice in what they would be doing. And there he was with all the joys of communal living, communist style. Excuse me. Despite this not being the direction Martin would have chosen for himself, he excelled at the dance and was chosen at age 22 as a senior dancer for the National Ballet Company and spent two years in Havana. All expenses paid, of course, by the government. And again, in 1988, he was chosen with several other dancers to go work with the Mexico City Ballet Company, and he spent a year and a half in Mexico City. 
he was given $5 a day, $35 a week, all for his own to keep. And then Martin had an opportunity, in a way, to go whether he wanted to go. In addition to the Mexico City Ballet, there are several other dance companies and he learned that he could teach for them on the side and earn quite a bit of money, which he did, and which monies he kept very carefully hidden, never spending them. But in 1990, all this came to a halt when someone from the Cuba troupe turned Marden in to the government for his moonlighting. He would, of course, have been called back to Cuba to stay forever, his life direction one way down. And he set himself, his face. Martin went into hiding and eventually seriously began plotting to defect, defect. After six months, he put all he had in a plastic bag, including his savings, left Mexico City and headed in the direction of Laredo, Mexico, 702.07 miles, almost directly north. Whither goest thou? In Laredo, he makes contact with a man who says that for a hundred dollars, he can get him across the river in a way that he will get asylum and be safe. Now, a hundred dollars. That is not quite what we hear, that the traffickers charging thousands and thousands of dollars for each individual trying to cross the Rio Grande. No, this one man doing the right thing to help desperate people who have only one direction in their heart to cross to a better life. Martin put, is to put all his belongings in that plastic bag he has carried for six months and swim across the river, swim across, naked. Once he is on land, he is to take his Cuban passport and work hard in his hand, put that hand on his other wrist and say, I am wanting asylum, I am defecting. And this is what happens. He is processed through immigration, put in contact with the Cuban family in Queens, New York, as his sponsors. And they, too, had come from Cuba in the same way. The site that will forever stay with Martin is flying over New York City at night and all the lights filling that Manhattan island, a beacon welcoming him. A light forever is a symbol of freedom for Mahardin. Well, then the Queen's family help him to get a green card and a re-entry permit, which allow him to travel for work only. But the question of whither goest thou had only one answer, dancing. Looking in the phone book, they found Ballet Espanico, an off-Broadway dance review, but he, he had to audition for the company, a truly new experience. The direction of his life was now up to him. It wasn't automatic that he would be in the company. It was a matter of, is he good enough for the ballet Espanico? Well, he is. And he stays with them for a year, earning good money. And at the same time, he is taking ballet classes to improve his skills, but knowing now he can truly choose the direction of his life. At the school, he is being watched by the leaders of several other dance companies. He was asked by Elisa Monte of Dance Modern to go see one of her shows. And if he liked it, he was going to be part of that company. Once more, his choice now. The company goes on tour around the world literally to perform from Europe to the Far East and back to New York. And then he was with another company for two years 
and back to Alyssa. All the while, he is enjoying going to parties with other dancers, and there meets Sarah Horrigan, who is with another dance company doing Sleeping Beauty. One night, he is giving his own party, and here comes Sarah again. They get together seriously, but his company is going to Barcelona for two years, so Sarah decides to go with him. Then they decide that it was time to go home. The question of whither goest thou is now for the two of them to decide. The direction they went to come home was to Sarah's parents in Urbana, Ohio. They land in Columbus Airport at night. Columbus is not very lit up much. And then they drive to Urbana through the dark countryside. Oh, and Martin is asking, where have I come? What direction did I take? After a year, years of living in big cities, Martin thinks, no, something's wrong here. There aren't any lights. And after a year or so, a friend of Sarah's, uh, made, they made contact with a friend of Sarah's and uh, who led them to come here to Mansfield and the ballet company at Richland Academy. Perhaps, though, the most important event of the direction of Marden's life pilgrimage was in 2001. He was living on his own on 14th Street in the lower Manhattan, and he was ready to take his citizenship test. He had studied and was ready, very ready, because you were to be asked five questions which you had to answer completely correctly or you failed. So here he is scheduled to take the test at the immigration officer near the Twin Towers in New York City. Luckily, his appointment was at 9.30 a.m., so he wasn't directly in the area when those planes crashed and the towers fell. But still, he was very close. His appointment, of course, was canceled. He was sent a letter about three weeks later and told to go to Brooklyn for his test. The test was different than expected since many people had lost their appointments due to the attack. Many people were in the building and he received his number. He went to the office when it was his turn. He was asked if he was aware about the situation going on, meaning the attacks. Martin said yes. Then he was asked if he was willing to fight for America and he said yes. And then he was told, Congratulations, you are a citizen of the United States of America. Free at last. Free at last. Whither goest thou? Direction. Where are we going? When? How? With whom? Why? Martin's life direction when he was seven seemed that he would never be able to make a decision on his own. The government rules everything in Cuban life for everyone. The control of everything is ruled by a few, never caring what it does for the individual or the society. And Jesus set his face for Jerusalem to take on the task that God had given him. He would be called King of the Jews, and he could have called down for himself all the power, all the possessions, all the provisions that the world offers. He could have ruled forever from a throne of steel. We long today more than ever with the world in such turmoil in so many ways, not just the pandemic, but unrest and hatred and selfishness and greed and pride. We want God to come with all God's power and force and make the world whole again. We know that if he had come as a conquering hero, we would lose. However, however, and this is, this is where our whole faith hinges, we know 
that if Jesus had come as a conquering hero, we would lose everything that Marden prized most, his freedom to choose the direction of his life. But as he set his face to go to Jerusalem, he came riding on a donkey, the symbol of humility, a sign that this would be, not be a revolution with guns and bombs, but with a cross. And he set his face to go to Jerusalem. We don't know, any of us know, where, when, how our lives will end, but we do know that without the faithfulness shown by Jesus as he set his face resolutely, steadfastly, and determinedly toward Jerusalem, there would be no light, no shining beacon to lead us to the freedom of life that he gave us. We go this day to Jerusalem, hailing him with hosannas and leafy branches. And yet, as he came near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, If you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Indeed, the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up ramparts around you and surround you and hem you in on every side. They will crush you to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave within you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation from God. Whither goest thou? Come now, let us go to Jerusalem on the pilgrimage he has set before us. Amen. Sunday. I found a beautiful grove of forsythia bushes and they're in bloom, starting to bloom, which is a sure sign of spring and a beautiful reminder for as we approach the Easter holiday that really marks us as Christians. Please join me in prayer. Dear God, in normal times we would be gathered together on our front lawn with brothers and sisters from other churches. We'd be waving our palm branches and singing Hosanna, Hosanna. You made a triumphant entry into Jerusalem, but we know the triumph didn't last through the week. Let us be mindful of the fact of everything that you went through, which means how much you can identify with our prayer needs. We come to you this week with heavy hearts, mass shootings, the fear and pain that our Asian friends are experiencing because of racism. We know that you too are sad when any, when any of your children are hurting. Please give us the wisdom, the strength, and the bravery to do something about gun violence. Help us think this through and take wise steps to prevent future pain and tragedy. 
thoughts and prayers are not enough. We bring to you also special needs of friends in our community. We pray especially for our brother Frank, who is in the hospital recovering from procedures. Be with him, grant him peace, be with his caregivers, his medical team, as they guide him through this patch. And be with him as he requires the strength to go through rehab and strengthening and all those things. And let him know that you are with him and that so are we. We also pray for Kirk Gay and Nancy Gay as Kirk just moved into a memory care facility. We pray for Pastor Ken's sister, Linda. We pray for missionaries, including one of Ken's former students, Hunter, who is suffering from cancer, and Father Joe, formerly of next door at Newman, who is ill in Rome. But we also bring to you some joys and celebrations. Isaac has returned to work. Leslie's friend, Chris, is continuing to get stronger and adjust and even making escapes to Dairy Queen for ice cream. We pray for babies. We pray for Pastor Ken and Helen as they are excitedly waiting for news for a new grandchild in Philadelphia. And we pray for our own Ari and Caleb. These are such exciting times for these young couples. Be with them, grant them comfort, comfort, grant them peace, grant them wellness and health, and let us know how to best support these new little ones who come into the world so loved already. We also bring to you our great thanks and celebrations over the COVID shot. It is almost with giggling joy that some people accept their shots. We pray for researchers and medical providers as they work hard to find ways to improve our lives. Let us accept these things with the joy and thanksgiving they deserve. We ask you to be with us this week, this holy week, which takes Christians through a roller coaster of feelings and experiences. Let us get the most out of those. Help us learn from them. We pray for all these things in your loving name. Amen. Now this is the offertory portion of our service. This is a time when we reflect on God's goodness to us, God's care, His love, um, and um, the ways that He's blessed us. Uh, it's also a time for us to uh, to offer to God uh, ourselves anew, uh, offer God from our resources, offer God from our lives, from the gifts that He's given us, the spiritual gifts, uh, to enter into an adventure the adventure of uh, following God, uh, the adventure of giving and caring for others. Uh, if you uh, would like to give to UBC and uh, University of Baptist Church, um, uh, we, you may write a, uh, you may write a check and mail it to UBC, uh, 50, West, 50 West Lane Avenue, uh, Columbus, Ohio, 43201. Or you can go online to the uh, UBC website. That's uh, ubccolumbus.org, and scroll. And on the first page, scroll down to donations. And there's some, and then, then there's a place for you to indicate uh, how you want your don your donation designated. Uh, so on this Palm Sunday, on this day that disciples, uh, um, thousand, a couple thousand years ago. Uh, laid palms out on the street and offered their voices in praise. Uh, let us offer our gift to God today, too. Let us pray. Oh, God, we give you thanks for your goodness to us. We know that you're, you care about us. You care about and you are uh, glad when we, we offer ourselves back to you. Uh, keep calling us, God. It's in the offering. Yeah, it's in the call and it's in our offering to you that we become the people that you want us to be. Um, bless these these gifts which will, which others which people are considering giving, gifts of their lives, resources from their lives. In Christ's name, Amen.
Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord turn his face and shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace now and forevermore. Amen. Shalom, Shalom, Shalom.